three, two, one, and here we go. Um, good morning, Dr. Lee Piccarello. Dr. Hunter Stevens. Jessica. Um, let's just kind of, like, I was watching the Flyers at 11 o'clock last night. Same here. And Same. Uh, I insisted on staying up. Actually, my son made me stay up. I, I, I'm not... I wasn't that into it. You He's were not going me into to stay it. up when they went into double overtime. Um, that part was exciting. Okay. <laughs> um, but more more specifically, you see, if you ever played uh, baseball, uh, if you ever played the position of catcher, you convince yourself that you would be a really good goalie. At least I have, because mm-hmm. that's what I used to do. Carter Hart, and um, fact check me on this, Jess. I want to say forty eight saves. Okay. I'm 47, 48. Yeah, they had about 52 shots. An insane amount of shots, of shots that they put on, and especially in the overtimes, as you, you both watched it, uh, Carter Hart had maybe three, four phenomenal saves. Mm-hmm. The game should have been over uh, a lot earlier than it was. But um, when you watch something like that and you see a goalie kind of – Put a team on their back mm-hmm. because the the Flyers didn't have a lot of shots early. No, and you could say they had four goals early. Mm-hmm. I think on less than twenty shots. Right. But uh, how do you feel about that one position in particular can just sort of uh, ignite and lead a team? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's important to have. I think in any sport there is. I I think it's the one player. It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific position. I think the goalie, who's the only player in the entire team who's on the ice at all times, at all moments, um, or that that they are literally in front of the goal of the game, right? Of to score, and they're the last line of defense. And so, without them, uh, the other team is much more likely to achieve the objective of winning, right? Um, so he's maybe in a position more so to influence the game. But if someone goes off and scores a hat trick, I think that is a whole nother different story as well. The quarterback can do that. The running back can do that. The wide receiver, the defensive end who strips it, right? Tom Brady at the mm-hmm. end of the Super Bowl. Right. Um, or, you know, it, basketball, the point guard, the guy who goes off, the person who shoots uh, lights out that night. It can be anyone at any time. It doesn't have to necessarily be a specific position, but it's more so the individual uh, on a team. Right, the the hot hand, if you will. Yeah, I just I, I I hear what you're saying. I just look at it a little differently because I think, especially in the sport of hockey, um, like there's some there's some basic things that um, I don't align with because playing a sport on a different surface, mm-hmm. I think, is a very um, unique skill mm-hmm. to to have. And I know that most hockey players probably, if not before they learn to walk or learning to skate, right. you, you, you mentioned a lot that, you know, being uh, a, a Floridian, mm-hmm. uh, that you learned how to swim mm-hmm. before you learned how to walk because yes. you were in the water so early. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like on water skis or skates, I, I, there's just a, a, just a different animal to that. And when you, speaking of today's topic, uh, you know, animals, humans, and, and instinctual behavior, the... The, the how I think certain positions need to behave because of the type of sport they're playing. Um, you can stay within um, your the, the confines of your role as, uh, as a forward, as a defenseman, mm-hmm. and, but you're still limited to that. I think the position of goalie, yeah, obviously you have to stop the puck. Mm-hmm. I, I get it. Yep. But I think there's just a, uh, a number of faces that you have to wear. Mm-hmm. Uh, throughout the course of a game, uh, a series, mm-hmm. um, he he find he found a, a flow state. Yes, you know, because he's just getting uh, berated with shot after shot after shot. It, it's almost as if it becomes um, second nature, instinct. very much like you know an animal instinct, instinct. You would say, yeah. Excuse me. Is that instinct? Yes, instinct for sure. Yeah, and and he's definitely performing and putting that out there. And then I think. Um, there was one per- play in particular where um, one of the Islanders, I think he was at the, you know, the kind of the 
the blue line about to kind of take a shot, a slab shot. And one of the flyers um, kind of boxed out two Islanders uh, players who were right in front of Carter Hart. So Carter Hart could have a clean line of sight on the puck as it's coming. So I think it's kind of the, the orchestration of his success enables other players to then say, I need this player to succeed in this moment. Right. And so I'm going to know my position, know my role so that this player can perform highly as yeah, well. That's a good analogy. Do you think that happens in other sports? I don't want to deny Jessa for Philly's fix. How many games have they won out of the last many? They're doing very well nine now. Nine out of ten. <laughs> right. So Bryce yeah. Harper said, I think we need to win the last nine out of ten, and they went out and they did it. Yeah. Uh-huh. So pretty Over, impressive. Uh, uh, win in the tenth inning yesterday by our new our newbie Alex Baum. Mm-hmm. Right, and they they swept the Nationals. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. I believe so. Do they have mm-hmm. another game with them? If they mm-hmm. haven't, then no, yes, they swept they them. Sweep them. Yeah. 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 I believe they put a tw- uh, post on Twitter before the series and has recently actually taken that down oh, I was gonna uh, about it. the statistic of how the Nationals have been beating the Phillies more often. Oh. And so the Nationals has actually taken down that post there you have after it. getting swept by the Phillies. So again, thinking about position, you know, Carter Hart, goalie, is mm-hmm. there a position like that in baseball where, you know, aside from the obvious of what I would say is pitcher, pitcher. that you can kind of put a team on your back, on your shoulder, the, the, or the leader of the pack, you know, again, yeah. we're talking about animals, humans, instinctual behavior. We're going to be getting into that in a little later in our discussion, but is there a position that we can kind of point to? I would look in the batting lineup. And now they have they shifted due to statistics. If you're the second batter, you know, typically it was a third or fourth, you know, like you're clutch hitter. Three, four, five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The now the, the statistics show like your best hitter should be second. Hmm. But either way, um, yeah, I feel like because that's the only person who like a pitcher can do as much as they want with the game. But if their, de- or their offense isn't hitting for him, like they're going to lose. However... The pitcher can give up 10 runs, but if a hitter's, you know, getting things going, I feel like maybe I would look in the bat in the batting lineup. Mm-hmm. I int- wanted to go to catcher, but... Well, it's interesting we're talking about this in team sport dynamics, right? Like the individual player who kind of takes over right. or the position that's more likely to take over uh, the game. And, you know, uh, I tend to be the, the mindset of the team oriented, but you always have that hot hand you kind of go to in the bottom of the ninth or the uh the fourth quarter uh or the third or fifth set um, yeah. where you need you need the play to happen mm-hmm. and this player is going off and that's the player you go to right that's a good point the closer mm-hmm. see i think of lenny dykstra with the phillies mm. at, at their heyday um when uh they became so good but he was, you know, the center fielder. He was the leadoff hitter, uh, the the dude, and his pers- his persona her pers- his persona became so large that not only was he going to get on base, mm-hmm. but he was going to steal second. He was eventually going to score. I mean, he was the spark. He was right. he was the the ignition key, right? Mm-hmm. So if if you think about it, is it more about position or is it personality? When you think about these characteristics that we can always align, we've we've we're gonna you know, well maybe we should get into it right now. Well, the, well, it's interesting that you say that. Just before we jump into that, is like thinking about the personality of a position. Mm-hmm. Like to be effective in that position, do you need a specific personality? I, I would say in it, well, I think the stereotypes of right, some positions exactly. would say yes. Mm-hmm. But I think that the, the, the stereotypes of some of those molds have been broken. Hmm. When you think about the, the traditional quarterback, the, the, the traditional is no longer used right. in the same sentence as quarterback. Mm-hmm. When you think about the, the, the traditional pro style drop back versus the dual threat, mm-hmm. uh, the runner versus the passer, uh, the, the verbal, uh, you know, aggressive, verbose versus the mm-hmm. quiet, conservative methodical march down the field Mm -hmm. so i think it has been proven that it can be done in different ways right but i think that the stereotypes for sure still exist especially in amateur sports Mm -hmm. i actually think carter hart which i found to be interesting obviously for us he's had a um, mental strength coach or sports psychologist since his beginning of playing hockey Mm -hmm. and that really showed during the first um series when he got taken out early because he wasn't doing well and 
a lot of the the announcers or whatever you're listening to, they were a little scared for him to go back. Like, oh no, is he's he's 22 years old. He's never been in this situation before, and he came back even stronger and like shut out whatever the team was. I forget whoever the last season, uh, not last the series. Canadians. Yeah. So, um, just to add in there into our aspect, I thought that was interesting. The Montreal Hockey Club. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm a frustrated linguist. I, I, I have no problem admitting that. You've said that multiple times. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Why are hockey clubs? Clubs? Well, they're yeah. soccer clubs. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know. The, like the organization, League. The organization and the hockey club. The clubs. Baseball the clubs? clubs? Uh, not Cl- so much. The clubhouse? Yeah, the clubhouse. The, no, it's the clubhouse, yes. Baseball organization. But it's the baseball the organization club. I've heard or it's it the say. Phillies team. When you think about the hockey, they ne- you never say hockey team. You ever hear an announcer say hockey team? The Flyers hockey team? If you're in America. Yeah, I'm, I'm Washington saying, football team? It's the club. Well, let's not <laughs> oh, even go it. there. Uh, that's, that's, it is that's interesting a, that's because a different show. hockey's right. really similar, right, to soccer, and both of those are clubs. Clubs, right. Maybe maybe it's an international thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably. I don't know. Maybe it's not just a hockey thing. Right. Um, Should I figure it out? Right, maybe. I'm sure there's, yeah, look it up. I'm sure there's some factoid out there. Mm-hmm. Um Something that you and I talked about earlier in the week, actually you brought to my attention, which um, is, is, is certainly noteworthy, the David Blaine uh-huh. uh, YouTube special. Uh-huh. It was originally scheduled for, I think, earlier in the week. It was in Arizona. It was, it was, for, sun, it was for Sunday, the 31st, I believe. Um, and they were actually going to do it in New York. Right. Uh, but so you brought it to my attention. So what what uh, what went on there? I, right. I, I know that you you and I talked about it, but right. David Blaine, a, a magician known for unbelievable feats, wowing people. He Straight will, magic. He will steal your watch literally off your wrist. That type of stuff mm-hmm. um, has always done these feats uh, more so of kind of both the ma- magic, I guess, sense, but also the physical feats such as learning how to hold his breath for over 17 minutes. I think he has, I think he said over 20 minutes unrecorded technically. Uh, so he's done these physical elements of like staying in ice for like, I think it was a week. Um, all these things standing, I think in the desert and fasted for like two and a half weeks, something along those lines. Uh, but he wanted to do another feat and he did wanted to do this a little bit more, uh, for his daughter. And what he recalled was a moment in his childhood where his mother took him whose mother was a big inspiration with who took him to a movie theater to watch a little boy in a movie kind of fly away and float away on balloons. So he wanted to recreate that scene in real life. So yes, he was supposed to do it on, I believe August 31st. Uh, but because of wind and the conditions, he ended up moving it two more days to September 2nd in Arizona. And he had to jump out of a plane to get his actual professional skydiving license uh, I think it was around 500 times. I think he ended up doing it like 400 times, which means he was doing five to seven to eight jumps out of a plane a day. Uh, for a time, he had to get his hot uh, air balloon license. He had to get his like gas license because he was going to be flying uh, helium yeah. balloons and not just hydrogen balloons. So he had to get all these certifications in order to do this. And then, you know, he went up and he he went out there on september 2nd the conditions were good they said if if the wind was more than eight miles an hour they couldn't have done it because the the balloons would have been moving too much so the winds and the conditions were good there was a cold front coming in and he went up to over twenty five thousand feet now twenty five thousand feet maybe it sounds like yeah that's pretty high but that's actually the height of a class 1a i think airplane also that is the height of mount everest so when you get to there the weather and the temperature changes. So when you're at kind of that sea level, uh, you're at uh, you know 75, 80 degrees, and by the time you get up there, it's un- under one degrees Fahrenheit. And so he had to actually put on gloves throughout. He didn't start with a parachute. He decided to go up without a parachute, and of course, then put it on as he was ascending up at 10,000 feet. But if he would have waited too long, he potentially could have passed out. So he had to purge oxygen. He had to go. In order to actually help regulate his body with CO2 and O2, so that he wouldn't pass out at 25,000 feet and could skydive. Do you want? Do you want to be David Blaine? I think you do. I, the of way course. You say with such vigor and enthusiasm. <laughs> yes. I have to add something because I thought this was really interesting. So if you look at who he is, I thought he was a magician as well. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's an American illusionist, an endurance artist, an extreme performer. 
Yeah. I think why I said street magic is because I think that's how he got popular. Yes. Yeah. But it's illusion. He would just go out onto the street and just walk up to people and just say, "Hey, you want to you want to see something cool?" Like, you know, have you ever have you ever done any kind of magic? They're like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> and he just does amazing things to get reactions, but he does make things disappear, reappear. I've seen him tear a quarter in half with yeah. his teeth hmm. mm-hmm. and then spit Back the together. piece back to the quarter and it sticks, but like it's a pristine quarter. His yeah. big feats that he's been doing recently is he's been watching other, uh, I guess, illusionists or feats of, I guess they wouldn't necessarily be illusionists. These people are more feats of magic in some capacity, um, do different stunts. And he would say, can I recreate that? So there was this guy who was actually known as the human terrarium. So he'd actually... Um, make a terrarium style in his stomach by drinking excess amounts of water and then actually hold animals fish and frogs within his stomach and then be able to regurgitate them so he actually learned this feat (laughs) and can store up to almost 10 frogs alive they've he said he's never harmed a frog and he can store up to 10 frogs and then just bring them out at will and so he's actually done that he's also he can he'll drink over like two gallons of water then drink kerosene, blow fire, spit the rest of the kerosene to make the fire get bigger, and then we'll become, I think it's, there's a name, I think it's called the human fountain, where he'll take all that water he drank, the two gallons or so, and it'll actually just like kind of, again, regurgitate it, and it'll just kind of spray out like a fountain to put out the fire. So, here, so here we are talking about animals, humans, mm-hmm. and the, the instinctual behavior. Let's try to break David Blaine down mm-hmm. just as far as, like, you know, what do you think as far as his makeup is concerned, his personality, um, all of these feats that he's doing, many, many people would deem close to inhuman. Mm-hmm. Because we don't operate that way. Clearly, he can function in that capacity and do these feats while existing as a human being. Mm -hmm. Because unless he reveals himself (laughs) as some type of alien species, we're going to make the assumption that he's human. He Mm -hmm. might be an alien. Right? He might might be. Mm -hmm. Because because the things that he does are that foreign to us. So Mm -hmm. let's take one step back. When you think about animal behavior and you think about instinct, Mm -hmm. when you think that their ability to survive, to hunt, to even to to have to kill one another, Mm -hmm. uh, the survival of the fittest, Mm -hmm. what do you think, how do you think David Blaine is is made? What do you think is is his, uh, if we were, if he was a watch and we opened him him up, Mm -hmm. what would his innards look like? (laughs) Well, I think, I think if you asked him maybe, 15 years ago uh you know obviously re- disregarding age and all, everything like that i think he has manipulated himself he has leveraged physiology in a way that he can now perform these stunts uh through training through understanding it through now medical science he puts himself through the kind of the rigors of those challenges in order to manipulate his physiology but the biggest thing is to recognize the limits that people would perceive is I can't do that. I can't, I couldn't hold my breath for more than three minutes. You know, he's breaking those barriers of limitation or the mind more so, um, by leveraging those physiological systems and recognizing how adaptive humans actually are. But when you think about, um, the, you know, the concept of staying comfortable, uh, clinically is called stasis, mm-hmm. right? Think about what we do to make ourselves comfortable. We've had conversations in the past when we talk about, You know, uh, when we would spoke of the eagles, you mentioned them earlier uh, with the hungry dogs run faster. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do? We actually highlighted this when the hungry dogs get fed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We get comfortable. Mm -hmm. Someone would suggest that we get lazy. Mm -hmm. We get static. Mm -hmm. Right. If you think about someone like David Blaine, who's constantly pushing the envelope, what does that say about him and how he's built? I think more of a an interesting concept is to literally put David Blaine and David Goggins in the same sentence because <laughs> everything that David Blaine does, David Goggins does for optimal performance in the same way, but for different reasons. Right. They'd be really interesting to take and then put, let's take these two guys and figure them the out. The case study. Yeah. Right. Of David David's. The, ooh. The David we, we need to reach out to their agents. Yes. That's it. It's, it's the battle of the, <laughs> uh-huh. the, the, the David's. Um, Again, it's it's really them. Well, I think David David Blaine's 
biggest motivation based on kind of what he has been talking about really has been for a long time that wow moment for people and that's really what it is and that's the magic right when you say magicians it's not what they're actually doing it's the reaction that they they shift you can have a having a terrible day and then when someone pulls the card that you thought or it was in your back pocket somehow or they've somehow shoved it into your your watch band and has done this shift your 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 mood changes your attitude shifts um, and that's the magic behind it. Do you think something that, that David Blaine does on a regular basis, when I mean, you think about human performance, you think that's something that can be trained? You think that, again, the, the simple answer is yes, because he's doing it to himself. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I agree with that as a blanket statement, because he's our modern day Houdini. He's definitely hardwired right. uh, in, in a capacity to... Um, have, have that drive. Do you have to be hardwired that way, though, to, to, to kind of receive that type of, of training? I think to be open to it more, right? And to do it at a, at a, at a younger age and, and kind of grow up with that mentality. I think you do have to have some hardwiring, maybe yeah. a little off <laughs> in a way. To, or different. To, right. And, right. Some might deem it, most may deem it as off, but right. certainly different. Right. But those those are the people also who then break those limitations and barriers. So is it off? Is it actually those people who are stretching those boundaries of what we perceive as our limitations? Well, the more interesting topic is why is it deemed off at all? Right. Are we doing that to maintain and preserve our own safety? Mm. Right. Because we want to separate ourselves from something so special and so unique. Right. Because we've convinced ourselves that we can't be part of that party. Mm -hmm. We're never going to be in that category. So therefore, it's odd. Mm -hmm. They're different. Or or in some positive cases, they're simply special. Mm -hmm. It allows us as human beings to separate ourselves even more. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So... So uh, mental strength speaking, um, David Blaine is a growth mindset versus the fixed mindset, right. which technically is the pop other like everybody else who's saying, yeah, that's really cool, but I can't do that. Right. But and he's saying, well, you could if if you want to, you could. Mm. So that's I think that's the difference with him is he and David Goggins, these people who find what's uncomfortable. And once they did that and they pushed through it, they were like, wow. It's not so bad anymore, and I'm going to keep doing that. And now they just let it manifest, and now they're just like, I think I figured out how to continue to be the best person or best version of myself. It's it's actually a little scary. It's almost like they're superheroes because mm-hmm. like they figured out this part of them, and they're not doing anything different than us. We see it like in glimpses of people like Kobe Bryant. He like when he's like you know something great that he's done. He had a little bit of that because he kept pushing himself a little bit further. I think it's, I think to answer your question, yes, like we can do it. It's, I think overall, it's like, do we want to? Do we want to hold on to a bunch of helium balloons and travel up into the sky just because? And a lot of people would say no. Right. Why? Well, I think it's it's more about the the threat to existence mm. that that becomes mm. more of a, a significant factor to hold on to while it. It, it, it's it's analogous to the thrill ride, right? right? Yeah. It, it's 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 not an apple to apple, but it's in the same conversation. I can look at something and say that must be so exhilarating, and even garner enjoyment from watching someone else do that, or 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 listen to the story from a loved one mm-hmm. that I watched do it and still get enjoyment from it. But there's no way I'm going to do it yeah. myself. Mm-hmm. Why? Because you. You might die. Right. Well, self-preservation. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Right. And, and I think there's power in that. I think having that type of self-preservation, I think um, you can recognize that if this is where I feel comfortable, this is where I feel safe. And then you're always going to be looking at these people as, well, these are the people who are breaking the boundaries versus myself, or I couldn't do that, or I wouldn't do that, or I wouldn't necessarily uh, put myself in that position. And the question is why? And we're talking about self-preservation, and that's, I think, the, one of the most fundamental animal instincts, if you will, of a human, is that will to continue to survive. Right. Is it a characteristic that we're just going to hang on the human race when, you, again, thinking about no. shifting back to well, the overarching mm-hmm. animal and human, the instinctual behavior? Because I could make the argument that animals mm-hmm. that are not human beings 
uh, have a uh, even more dominant survival instinct, al- almost to a default. We're, we're, we're some of the first creatures on Earth that probably are thinking about other things than, than our own just existence. survival right. and sex and reproduction. Right. We're, you know, if it, technically in the animal species, those are the driving factors between, right. you know, is the, the Charles Darwin mentality of... Right. You know? But but speaking of that, and, and I think this is a is a, a good segue. I know that we we have a clip, and I don't know if we can bring that up, but um, it's uh, Jane Goodall who uh, spent her entire life uh, studying chimpanzees and human emotions. Uh, I believe because the first thing I thought of when I saw her in this clip was that there was a movie made of her of her mm-hmm. life played by Sigourney Weaver, mm-hmm. um, who. Um, essentially immersed herself in the study of chimpanzees, I want to say uh, in the, the, the sixties and uh, has made decades uh, longs of research uh, more credible to the scientific community mm-hmm. in explaining uh, how similar chimpanzees are to human beings yeah. and really looking at the emotion, their ability to emotionally express uh, their ability to to socialize. She even makes the the, the comment that there is more political behavior mm-hmm. amongst the groups. Yeah. Uh, very fascinating clip. Can we take a look at that? Sure. The behavior of chimpanzees, and it shouldn't surprise us that, given the similarity of brain and nervous system, that they are capable of intellectual performances like the tool using and tool making, which used to be considered the hallmarks of the human species. And chimpanzees are capable of so many fascinating intellectual performances. For a captive chimpanzee can learn more than 400 of the signs used by deaf people, American Sign Language. And they can use those signs when communicating with each other as well as communicating with their teacher. In the wild, I think one of the most fascinating expressions of intelligence is the way they manipulate each other socially. It's quite extraordinary mm. how adept they are. In fact, books have been written about chimpanzees' political skills because they form alliances. They're so quick to pick out the weakness in a, in a superior, someone who's normally dominant to them, but maybe he's got a little wound or he's hurt himself or he's got a headache and he's just we not up there? to par. So we could we should clear the afternoon and mm. and, and, and if, we, if we want to go after <laughs> right. that most recent statement of their their political behavior and and uh, addressing the perception of weakness um, have you seen uh, rise of the planet of the Apes the newer one um, when, when they're 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 fully conversing I, I think no 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 so the rise of the planet of the Apes um, the one with uh, James Franco. Have you seen that one in there? No. Like the higher CGI, like more so. And so it's a really interesting, uh, pretty much what happens is Caesar, who is that person everyone kind of looks to as the 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 creator, right? Right. Um, You know, he he goes away. I'm not going to kind of tell the full story of how he became, but more so he uh, kind of ends up in this uh, sanctuary, if you will, for chimpanzees. And he's been living with humans. for let's say like five years so he's been growing up with human behavior he's obviously exceptionally smart he was uh his mom was um introduced with like this rare chemical and so then he got the powers to be able to have a high intellectual intelligence all this stuff and so he ends up in this uh place where these chimpanzees have kind of been sanctuaried but there's this leader and uh i think his name's kovu and he has this like scarred face and all this stuff and uh, he's the leader and so immediately when caesar gets to there he gets beaten down because he like doesn't know the social hierarchy in the the sanctuary right in the and he community gets, yeah, and he, established. Gets, he gets beat down immediately yeah um and then he, as you can imagine him slowly learning things he um steals chips ahoy from like one of the the caretakers there and starts to feed the other chimps to get him on his side. Um, he uh, he um, picks he like watches uh, a code get put in uh, for the gorilla that's kind of locked away, and so he lets the gorilla out have like a free play time because he's been locked in this small cage. So now the gorilla is on his side, and he then unlocks and lets Kovu out just in the yard alone. And it's just him, the gorilla, and Kovu, and now Kovu has to listen and kind of puts his hand out and respect 
to Caesar as Caesar rises into this political so position. So he, he worked his alliance, uh-huh. and then right, it came to a head. Mm-hmm. When you when you see uh, examples like that, and then you 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 hear about the science behind this woman who's really devoted her life to the study of chimpanzees, I uh, was very taken by that video. So I continued to watch. And she goes on to tell a story about how chimpanzees, if they, if their mother dies before the age of five, mm. really struggle. And she started to explain the types of behaviors that they, uh, the mothers will carry them on their back. They will um, snuggle with them when they sleep at night. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they provide milk early on in their life. But she went on, because she's done such extensive research in these communities of chimpanzees, she went on to explain that this one particular chimpanzee who lost his mother uh, at around three or four uh, was taken in by a 15-year-old chimpanzee. Uh, Full adult age in the chimpanzee world is about 25. Hmm. And at around 15, considered adolescence for chimpanzees, you start to... um, challenge after modeling Mm -hmm. the young adult chimpanzees so you're right at that stage of wanting to spread your wings and go and test the waters um to compete for uh food obviously for mates in the future Mm -hmm. and this particular adolescent chimpanzee male took this other male under its wing and became a maternal role Mm. uh, and let that young chimp you know, ride on his back. He slept with him and nestled to him and kept him warm at night, really mentored him. And I found that absolutely fascinating. Mm. The uh, DNA difference between a chimpanzee and a human being is 1%. Right. Yes. And then you think about, she went on to say that in a dire situation, human beings could actually receive a blood transfusion from a chimpanzee. Wow. Um, you That's think about amazing. think about how amazing that is. Mm-hmm. I wanted to. This is a little secret about myself because I think you know I was a pre vet for a long time. Yes, yes. Worked at the zoo, yeah, yeah, yeah. did all of this. So yeah. I will not be surprised. One thing I always wanted to do, I still do, is be an animal behaviorist when I become a doctor <laughs> and and go into Africa and Congo where they are and study gorillas and monkeys. I you love want to be it. Jane Goodall. Jane, she was my <laughs> idol. So I would educate myself on these. And my favorite, favorite thing that I've ever found that just made me like, yep, I don't know how, but it's going to happen. There was a gorilla that got taken in in Japan. Her name was Coco. Mm-hmm. The researchers taught Coco sign language because that's one thing that researchers always wanted to do. Can we actually communicate to these beings who are 1% different than us in DNA? And Coco not only learned sign language, She had a humor when she spoke. She talked really deeply about death. She would rip out magazines to show like she was she's like she's she's alive and well and she's teaching things. But the most interesting part about the entire thing, besides that we can talk to gorillas, is she taught her baby sign language which I think is really big on instinct, right? Like the gorilla mm. said, hey, this is a better way to communicate. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you know what? I'm going to teach and my that's, little that's one. That's fascinating. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Trust me. Of, the, of that I, trickle down. They made a lot of money, right, with the Coco and her yes, kittens. Yes, because Coco, she, yeah, Coco <laughs> and her kittens. They also made Coco, I don't know if Coco said it, but they made Coco talk about like stop hurting the planet, which was really endearing. <laughs> you can bring it up. You want to hear Coco because <laughs> it's sign language, but it was like, okay, I, mm-hmm. will, I will recycle Coco. Mm-hmm. Like... Yeah, it, that uh, I've been a member at the Philadelphia Zoo for a while, and so you give like the animal yeah. annual pass, but then you get free parking, you get a mission, and you can bring a guest, and so it's really nice. But it's also supporting; it's a nonprofit, and so I've been doing that for the past uh, three years. And so me and my fiance we will go, but typically we have she likes to avoid the the primates or the the great apes um, position because of how expressive they are and yeah. how aware they are. And because they're so close to us, it, it, is, it bothers her. It bothers her because that was a question they I know, got a lot. Yeah. You know, they know where they are. Right. Um, probably mo- more than most of the other animals there. Right. Yeah. That's interesting because mm-hmm. them making that connection of the space that they're in. Mm-hmm. Um, very often, you will see some of the more powerful videos of different primates, uh, apes, uh, and they look sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. They look depressed. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I, and you know, it, it, it really can be that difference maker for the young aspiring Jess Ferdinands <laughs> of the world. I was okay. So I had to, of course, right? they were like, who do you like? I was like, well, I'd love to be with the gorillas. Cause I was just interested. So I would man like three years ago I had just left. So you didn't get to see me, but if you came over to the gorillas, <laughs> I was like, hi, welcome to the gorilla. Exhibit. <laughs> that was and you. I had to learn. <laughs> everything about who was at the Philadelphia Zoo. I knew all the names, and that was one of the main questions that I got um, like about captivity, and are you sad that they're in there? Why are they in there? Shouldn't they not be in there? Like All these like really heartfelt questions, and the answer that I was told to give <laughs> is that... Interesting statement. Is Because um, I, I don't like it either. I didn't know how to answer it, so I would have to answer it professionally, and it'd be like, look, like these girls, this is all they know, and if we were to let them out into the wild, they would die immediately. They're not prepared for that. So mm. if that makes you feel better, they're actually... And a lot of zoo animals, I thought, because I looked into this, because I was, and then I got upset. Like, oh my God, we're just putting animals in cages that shouldn't be here. Um, they started from like being like injured, and then they kind of take care of them, mm -hmm. and they just grow from there. But that's how it, it is. It is there. a fine line, though, because when you think about how they might fare outside of captivity, because they've yeah. lost their survival skills mm -hmm. yeah. or some of those instincts we have you know uh, tampered down for them they've humanized right in a way. so they don't know how to defend themselves as well or find food on mm -hmm. their own so you could make a host of arguments as to why but i also think too aside from the injured animal animals that are born in captivity yeah. that is all that they know mm -hmm. and i have to imagine probably if we continue to do that at a higher rate will eventually impact the species mm -hmm. because not that we'll have more in captivity than we are in the wild, but mm -hmm. eventually those numbers uh, will start to impact one another. Yeah. They definitely do specific um, uh, breedings and choose certain animals. There's actually, um, again, going back to the zoo, uh, I, I took my fiance there one time for like a behind the scenes and they have a jaguar who you've never seen if you don't, go behind the scenes because they don't let him out during the day because he was from the wild and his eyes looked different. They follow you when you walk. He was, yeah, but he was different. He like had this, it, it was this Jaguar, like big, he just was bigger. He just was stronger. He was from the wild. And they said, he's like a, a largely sought out, um, big cat because of his wild heritage. Like he, he's like a prime breeder to keep that like wildness alive within mm. the species because he has that. So it's definitely, they do that with like intentionality. So the question is because that big cat was from the wild, if bred, mm -hmm. will that cat reproduce right. a mirror Stronger. image of yeah. itself mm -hmm. that's then born and raised in captivity, mm -hmm. right? That, that trickle down uh, effect. Um, it makes me I seem to have Tarzan. the skill of just touching everyone's computers right. at the same time. So I think maybe I need to be put in a cage. I tried or to at Google least from this. the neck down. I realized it, did, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> and I, whatever. I tried to Google if like a human was born not, I, I was considering the human In the race. wild? I Tarzan. Was, I, yes, I was considering was the human race. Was he born in the wild? No, it's a yeah, young he was, child. No, he was, was born, he born in the wild? Yeah, he, he was, was born, born in, the in yeah. a hut right. and, the, and the, the panther or jaguar. Pan, the jaguar, yeah. Um, ate his family, but then he they hid the mom hid him, and then mommy gorilla came and was like, oh, hmm. "This is mine now." And the dad was like, "No." And then, <laughs> yeah, and then he eventually let him in. Anyway, <laughs> that was one of my favorite movies growing up, as you can tell. <laughs> um, I was considering the human race as being captive, like we're being held captive. We're being brought up to be like you have to um, get your driver's license, you have to get married, you have to listen. This is I sound like I'm crazy now. <laughs> You're talking about social captivity. Just, yeah, like where? What if you just had somebody not in it? Like, where would they go? I think that they would adapt. They would find um, a way of life. I think the the, the first uh, instinct to kick in would be survival, and I think that that would dictate uh, not everything, but a whole lot more thereafter. Because in that pursuit to survive, it would lead to other things. You would need to find some type of shelter, you, you know, you would need to find water, food to sustain life. And you wouldn't gravitate, you wouldn't drift far from that. So I could, you know, I, what's popping into my mind is very much like that of a wolf um, that just, 
becomes part of that wild environment yeah. um, simply to survive. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's why they created the show Survivor, right? To put those people in that position to say like what they would look like to survive, what they would look like to survive. But I think uh, there are, and we're also thinking about the American culture too, right? There are a lot of tribes out there who actually live in in, uh, significantly different ways. They still are hunting, hunting, gathering um, populations out there. But it's funny because Western society finds its way, kind of life finds its way, uh, Jurassic Park, but no, more so Western society tries to find its way. And now they're bringing technology to those villages. And mm-hmm. those villages, you would think, would be like, yeah, let's keep those cultures. I'm like, no, like technology is so much better. Like I can now have like a penicillin shot and like not die. And like these cultures are actually like, yes, we want to keep our culture, but at the same time, like, advances yeah. are positive the gu i'm sorry to this tribe the guajajara tribe mm-hmm. is in brazil so the the rainforest um they are the only tribe that i know of that refuse to let any outsiders in mm. journalists that's the the most recent thing oh, is that the killed, one on the island they get killed all the time because right. they say don't come here and they get killed with bow and arrow still like man-made the, the guy died because they said, don't come here. And he was like, well, I want to find it. Like, you know, the, you, the only pictures you have of them are like almost like droids that are flying over and you can see them trying to shoot them down. They want nothing to do with the outside world. And I love it. Like, mm-hmm. just, just don't bother them. Just let them go. Like, mm-hmm. let them do their thing. I can show you. Yeah, there. We, this is like the amount of photos this, that you have of just them looking up. It's like, leave them alone. Well, They're yeah. doing their thing. Well, the biggest thing is the reason why, I mean, this is speculation in terms of what I've read and heard in terms of advancements and how humans advanced was because, like, there was, like, sedentary time because we would go and hunt. Like, you would think people are hunting for long periods of time, but when you kill a woolly mammoth and you have food, like, you would actually have some downtime. Right. Um, so you'd really only be working around four to five hours a day and the rest of the time would be more innovation and creation um, and thinking and being able to think and to, you know, create pottery and design new weapons and uh, be creative. And then our species was able to adapt. And then when agriculture came along, that exploded that opportunity. Now we're no longer spending that time hunting and gathering. We created these new jobs, new positions. And think about society today. We don't even need to worry about food. We can literally get food almost anywhere. At just any, about anywhere. At, at any time. And so these new and innovative jobs continue to pop up and rise as we continue to evolve and innovate. So through the, the innovation and the science, it, does that necessarily mean that we are getting better as a species? Because when you think about, you know, we, we're talking about the animals. We're talking about the 1% difference between us and chimpanzees. We're talking about how... The instinctual fabric that all connects us as human beings in this part of the world where we live drives us to behave in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But as you bring in the era of technology, does that make us better? Because on the surface, it appears that we're more efficient. Yeah. So if you're defining better as efficiency, potentially. Well, I think the efficiency is what made it the most attractive the soonest Mm -hmm. right well the 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 smartphone evolved out of the traditional phone because it could simply do more to make your life easier if the drive is to um to survive and also to reproduce right if those are two of the elements uh, we're getting better at that for sure right people are living longer there's more centurions right i know that i guess the the population. You there. were just waiting the moment to say centurion, right? The, yeah. the yeah, yeah. As your Roman example earlier, before <laughs> we were talking, um, <laughs> as I touch on the touchy, touchy subject, but more so, right? Those hundred-year-old people, but also um, people who maybe originally wouldn't have gotten pregnant are now having the ability to be pregnant because of uh, new technology, new advances in vitro, all of that stuff that kind mm-hmm. of maybe wouldn't be there as well. Um, so if, I guess on that survivalistic, so we can reproduce population. better and we can live longer, but does that technology comprehensively, um, how does that aid to the value of us as human beings? I think it taps into all of our worst qualities, to be honest. When you look at mm. Elon Musk, um, creating Neuralink, 
which is the brain chip that he's eventually going to have in in our human brains as a way to make us more efficient as a as a human but the thought process on it is when somebody can do something better than you that you know that you can just get that too every it's just going to be a domino effect so it, it seems to me it's like but what is that that's that's like these I want to be the next best thing, but that's human nature. That's human instinct. That's how we are designed to be the best we can. And if someone has something we want, technically speaking, you can go back to any biblical story, like any folklore type thing. Like there's going to be somebody who takes it from them because they can and they want to. So I think it's like kind of tapping into this like more of a negative but I am looking at it negatively. I will say that because what you brought up, I think I was not even thinking that. Like, there are so many great inventions now that has helped people. That is is amazing. Yeah, I think the original application or, or the initial ap- uh, application that he's trying to do with Neuralink yeah. is actually to help uh, people with disability because yeah. then you would have the same firing mechanisms that you would to walk, and then you would have uh, muscle stimulators within your legs, and thus you would be able to walk. Right. Or see if you're paralyzed, if you're or see, yeah. or uh, but of help we'll those take impairments. That to the next level. But the the the, the difference in interpretation mm-hmm. between the two of you, I think, speaks to the 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 larger bell curve of how people in general may look at things, mm-hmm. because something may be designed or invented with all the best intentions, mm-hmm. but to Jessica's point, someone who can't do it for themselves is going to want to steal it. And I don't mean literally, that could be emotionally, spiritually, there's all types of of theft Mm -hmm. that exists. And when you think about, again, driving us back to our, our overarching point, the survival mechanism within us as animals, I think is not as sharp. No. as it used to be Mm-mm. we are not as good as we once were right we're mm-hmm. we're the you know um i don't know what we are but it, it's it, and, and again this is not my line of study but because i specialize in human behavior and i'm listening to story after story of what people are struggling with and the while there might have been great intention behind technology the angst mm that technology provides the the amount of information uh, perhaps too much perhaps not enough the way in which we gather it the way in which we digest it it's not i don't think we're evolving in that natural capacity because of technology yes there's wonderful benefits of technology nobody can deny that Mm -hmm. but it's almost it's because it's expediting our evolution mm-hmm. that I, I think we're we're playing catch up. Yeah, I mean, evolution, it, you know, depending on your belief on it, right, occurs over millions of years. Yes. And the evolution of technology really from, let's say, technology has always kind of been around, but more so the 1800s to now, right, over a 250-year span, let's say, is so vast in terms of its growth and its continual growth and its continual speeding of growth um, that we can't necessarily process all of that effectively. Yeah. Right. We, you know, we, we think about this as so far away, like the, the wild west, right. Uh, Cowboys, native Americans, like those type of fights, like slavery. We think we're so kind of far off. Like we're really only like a few people away from, that yeah. type of lifestyle well, america is really young right, right. Which people forget right the human race is very young as well yes well if you think about just sort of where we are in our own little contribution if we're lucky we get a hundred years and the grand scheme of things when you look at millions of years mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a droplet in mm-hmm. the bucket of water you know to add to the more of getting back to how we've got away from primitive things Michael, I don't know if you want to bring something up. There's a man who I actually really enjoy watching. His name is Mr. Tufu, Tufu, T-F-U-E. And he builds things with his hands and only his hands. He goes, he's found it. His goal is to build, is to create like 
to get a whole like all these people with him that are only building from what are primitive tools he calls them. So he, there's videos and very relaxing. I, I want you guys to look at it. Um, he builds pools, like extravagant pools with clay that he finds the dirt, he brings the buckets. It takes him like 60 days to do it. And he has a guy who he got to video him, who just is like fascinated with him. And that's all he does. He just, he's, his goal is to build an underground city in America with primitive tools. So he's gonna do that and he found a, a small jungle in South America and that's where he's building. And the, the videos are really incredible. You're just watching him with like, he finds sticks and he's carving. And like, you're just mesmerized. It's like literally the rabbit hole of YouTube. Like you're just like, and you just keep going the video to video, but he's, he creates like really interesting stuff. But his thing is because he's mad, he's like, we can do this without all of this technology and I'm gonna show you. Mm -hmm. So he's literally, not lying, creating a city mm -hmm. with his hands. Well, in, in the, the, I think the spirit of that conversation, what you're really talking about is someone who is a purist yeah. and are, they are so devoted to their craft and don't necessarily um, subscribe to the notion that um, technology is a good thing and what in fact can be created from the most primitive of our tools, which are our hands, is, is something to, um, to behold. And, 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 and to, a, to a larger point, what that really activates in the human spirit um, I know at some point we wanted to talk about uh, our inner animal. Um, so I think at this kind of stage, you know, where are we in the animal world? How do we see ourselves? What do we align with? Um, Hunter, you and I were talking about before the show. Do you, you really have to be in touch with the type of characteristics of the animal to align with it? Uh, I was one more of that, you know, gravitate to... Uh, physical appearance and what the animal looks like. So, if, if what, what animal would you guys be if you were a, your if you, we, we were spirit to, animal a spirit animal? Okay, this go is ahead, a hard question. Go. I okay. think I'm just gonna. Go, I'm not even gonna think about it because then I'll be thinking for ten years. I've always considered myself in the big cat family, maybe like a panther. I think a panther because okay, I have always been very quiet but like feisty, <laughs> but doing it quietly. And, and I have always observed from behind the scenes. So I will, and I, I won't react at first. I will take it in and then think about it and then react. And I feel like a panther is very sly and they're just kind of like, but they're still like really, their presence is known. I'd like to hope that my presence is known in a room, even if I'm sitting in the background. So I, <laughs> You can clearly tell what I think about myself. <laughs> I would say a panther, a jaguar, a big cat. I don't think I'm a lion. That's a little. That's a little bold. That's a little bold. Yeah. King of the jungle. <laughs> so you, you got some the humility jungle. then. Yeah. How about you, Hunter? Huh. This is difficult. Um, you know, my first instinct was to go to something that is, I guess, cool. <laughs> if yeah. you will. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I have an opinion about the, this overarching right. topic, which I will save for later, but go ahead. I did take your quiz, so I'm interested to see what you say, and I'll tell you what your quiz is. Your cool, okay. your, your cool spirit animal. Right. Well, if I want to go my cool spirit animal. Oh, your cool one. I, I can do a cool one, I can do one. I think okay. that is more maybe a line. I think my cool one would definitely be a wolf uh, in, in the sense of... Um, I definitely can thrive alone, but in a pack, I feel like I'm maximized in, in that. Mm -hmm. And something I really like about wolves, and especially I, I view myself in kind of sometimes that leadership role, uh, wolf packs will typically actually, the leader will actually kind of be from behind. They'll kind of be kind of in that trailing. They actually won't be necessarily up front all the time. They're going to direct people. They're going to send it. They're going to bark at people and nip at heels if people get out of line, but they're going to be in the back, just kind of surveying, making sure that nobody's falling off. So I find myself doing that as well, kind of making sure I'm kind of watching the team, um, you know, make sure everybody feels like they're maximizing by a while. So dealing with my own stuff. Um, so that's what I would say would be my cool spirit animal. Uh, I guess my more mundane one would probably be, I, I don't know. Uh, I think a, a horse would be a good one. Um, they tend to be uh, reliable. They tend to be sturdy. They can be very athletic. Um, they have big hearts. 
that type of stuff. So I think your uh, quiz show is so, so, so well thought out and so, be a good one. so poetic. That yeah. was. Mine yeah. was all like choppy and yeah. Don't put mine in the clip. Um, <laughs> your quiz showed you to be an owl. Owl. Ooh. Just saying. An owl. <laughs> Very nice. Harry Potter. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, um, I, I don't think about this topic a whole lot. You know, the, the, the interview question, like, if you were a fruit, what would you be? If you were an animal, what would you be? It's very psyche to me, yeah. right? So I, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. But one thing I did think about, knowing that this would come up, is there is a scene from Bull Durham with Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon. And he asks her, um, who do you think you were in your past life? And Susan Sarandon, who plays this character, uh, this literary uh, woman who uh, believes in the, the church of baseball, um, goes off about how she's this famous character and, uh, you know, uh, has uh, wealth available to her. And she's part of a, of a larger a regal hierarchy. And, and Kevin Costner is eating a bowl of cereal and he says, did you ever know? That when you imagine yourself in past lives, you always imagine yourself as someone famous. Hmm. He goes, how come nobody ever says in my past life I was Joe Schmo? And, and, I, and I, why I think that's relevant to this conversation is I never really think about the, the characteristics of, say, like a horse or sturdy or a wolf, mm -hmm. which in knowing you, those things make sense. But I don't think in that capacity of... If I were an animal, what would I be? And, and truth be told, I don't think about it often, but now that it's been brought up, I gravitate to the water. Uh, I grew up on a river, um, probably was swimming before I could walk, um, did the swim team thing when I was younger, did not compete in team sports in the water. But in all of my travels, wherever I have gone, I always will find water, I will get in the water, I will be the first in, I will be the last to leave. And the older that I get, um, I like to spend what I'll just call mindful moments floating in the water. It, it's really one of the few times at this stage in my life that I genuinely feel at peace. Uh, have you ever done that thing where you've been in the shower or you've got the shower head that's kind of drowning out your ability yeah. to hear, but mm -hmm. you like can hear out. yourself breathing or mm -hmm. you can hear. It's like that underwater yeah. sensation. I thoroughly enjoy that. I love floating and having my ears immersed in water and being able to hear myself breathe like I have an amp in my head. So if I were to choose the animal that I would align with, I think of a whale that, that only comes up for air every now and then. But when they do, when, when they appear, they, they make a statement. Um, they spend most of their existence beneath the surface. Um, they are one of the largest in the sea world, but don't necessarily impose themselves as such. Uh, and then I go to the dolphin because of the, 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 the nature in which they can communicate with one another. They seem to have like that different genetic chip um, that allows them to do special things amongst them. And I, and I think I gravitate to the dolphin because in my line of work, I pride myself in my ability to communicate. And I think very often people who look for support struggle with communication. They either, they either struggle with the ability to express themselves or they struggle with the perception of being heard. So if I had to pick a uh, whale, dolphin. So you're going orca. So, yeah. Right? Orca is the, kind of the best of the boat, so right? Wolf, They're the wolves of the sea, if you will. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Right. They, they work in teams. They work in tandem. Right. Nothing messes with them. What was them. that movie in the 80s? No. Free Willy? No, have, no, no, no. I think no. you'd be a really good animal it's a, in the it's water. A, it's a sad movie. Oh. Um, Free Willy? No. <laughs> no. It's not Free Willy. Is it Willy. about the ocean? I want to say it's called Orca. 
Oh. Blackfish? No, 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 no. Uh, that no, happened I'm, more recently. I, listen, when I say older movie, okay. you guys probably were not around. Okay. Um, but it's a, it's a story of an orca that is hunted hmm. um, that continues to um, work its way north and the obsessed hunter follows and it it becomes that man versus animal battle of the wills amidst nature Mm -hmm. um quite applicable for for our discussion at this very moment so um, have you ever seen the video of the seal like sitting on the iceberg and three uh orcas swim to create a wake of water to push the seal off of the, right. the ice, like a like a little tidal surge that right. comes over that knocks it yep. over. Yeah. yeah, they're they're pretty remarkable creatures. I'm yeah, still they trying are. to think of. I think I have your really your your ideal who you would want to be. Uh, I think Hunter, you can help me. What is? It's not a seal. <laughs> this is not by your character, okay? It's not a seal, but it's like I can't think of the name, and they literally just float. Manatee. Yes, a manatee. Thank you, Michael. You're a manatee. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't align with the manatee. I, I remember, said it's not your character. I remember those. Uh, weren't there free the manatees or save the manatees bumper oh, yeah. stickers oh, yeah. for a while? It was huge in I Florida. Think like we would see them all the time. Yeah, they were just like in the. Did they get chopped up by propellers because they were close yeah, their to the back surface? Is a little bit yeah, because yep. they sun so they warm, yeah, warm themselves mm-hmm. right, come up to the surface. They just float so much. Sometimes they get chopped up. By <laughs> they're the definitely floaters. Yeah, right. Um, any final thoughts on our conversation today? Dr. Stevens. I think identifying, you know, I think we, we took an interesting discussion about how, you know, identifying us as animals. I and mean, I don't think humans typically do that is identify us as part of the animal kingdom. Uh, and obviously there's the ecological effects of it too, but our psychological nature and how we are driven by certain animal instincts as well, but also through advancement, through understanding by having the big brain, right? Our frontal lobe development versus other maybe creatures out there. We start to have a little bit more introspection. Um, and that can both benefit us and kind of, um, hinder us sometimes in, in in the way in pursuit of continued growth and development. Yes. Final thoughts. Um, I would say that I think we need to take a step back this weekend and remember <laughs> our roots. Yes, yes, we're going to take a step back and just float. I think this weekend, each and every one of us and our listening audience should do something primal, whether it's, I know you like to go for hikes, that's primal, we can consider mm-hmm. that. Like, get in touch with nature and leave your phone at home. Mm. That's it. Okay. Um, when you think about animals, humans, instinctual behavior, there, there's really, there is so much different about us but really nothing at all and it really depends on the context it depends on the setting um us being part of a species as homo sapiens um especially in today's world uh, august 2020 excuse me september 2020 um there's so much reason to want to act out to behave differently um, to find our true north, to settle in. Uh, there has been a even wider disparity between the notion of what is deemed right or wrong. But in the animal kingdom, it's just about survival. And I think in, in large part, what we're all experiencing in today's world is our own survival test of what we can endure as individuals collectively larger as a species and what we can learn from those experiences that in fact can make us better better tomorrow and better beyond for our children and our children's children so i think the 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 overarching impact for me when you think about animals humans and the instinctual behavior that binds us uh, has much to do with um, that one degree of separation that yes, in fact, makes us different, but really, we're the same. So for Dr. Hunter Stevens and Jess Ferdinand, my name is Dr. Lee Piccarello. Thank you so much for checking out the head game powered by Mindful Athlete Training, and we'll tune into you next week.